So we got Dale to come and look at it and pick out uh, a few select pieces. And so that's her talk today based on those things. But I know you've got a theme that you're going to do. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> well, I am more knowledgeable about quilts because I do collect quilts. At one time, I collected antique and vintage quilts. But then in 1985, I went to a, a first exhibit from the Visions, uh, what is now the Visions Museum in San Diego. Then it was just a group of ladies that got together a show of contemporary quilts. And I was just blown away. I had no idea that people did this, did this kind of thing. And so I immediately packed up my antiques and vintage. I still have them. And, <laughs> and I started collecting uh, what they now call art quilts. Um, I don't think that that's kind of appropriate. I think they're more contemporary to me is what I collect. Um, I don't go out and look for art quilts. But I have quite a collection. I have 370, oh, but some goodness. of them are only this big. And um, mm. there are different places that you can participate in auctions. And that's what I do. I, I participate in the online auctions. And most of those are 12 inches by 12 inches. So they're really easy to store. <laughs> so, but I do have piles of quilts and rolls of quilts everywhere. <clears throat> but what we're talking about today is, is that some of the things that they have in their collection here. Um, we start with cloth. When we're born, we're wrapped in cloth. Maybe today they use plastic, I don't know. <laughs> but for thousands of years, they, they wrapped in cloth or, or hides or something to wrap the baby in. And that is applied all our lives. We all wear clothes, we all wear textile for our homes. And so it's, it's an integral part of our life that we don't think about because it's just there. It's always there. So <clears throat> the, um, the first thing that that you need to realize is that before about 1890, there were no sewing machines, treadle or any other kind. They all had to be sewed by hand, and a woman's job was to make everything. She made the sheets, hem the sheets, she made the clothes, she made the textiles for the house. She, I mean, there were men tailors, but mostly it was women that did the job. And they had so many different techniques and uses that they, they did. Um, you notice I'm wearing gloves. I, I, we have not been real um, faithful to that. But when anytime you're doing anything with something that's vintage or antique, you want to wear gloves. If you're doing picture framing, if you're catching antique uh, gilded frames, you don't want to put your fingers on it. You want gloves to protect from the oil in your skin. And um, I mean, usually when you go to a quilt exhibit or a quilt show, they ask you, please don't touch. Because if a thousand people touch it in exactly the same place, that's where it's going to start deteriorating. And some of these pieces have started deteriorating just because they were worn. And many things that we have as collectibles now are things that weren't used very much. You don't see house dresses and little little boys' shorts and and things like that because they wore out. And in the olden days, they um, they recycled them. They remade them in things. When I was learning to quilt, um, I was seven, and my grandmother taught me how to piece together squares to make a doll quilt. And and some of those squares came, for example, the inside of a pocket, uh, especially an apron pocket, because the inside didn't get worn. So they'd cut that out into a square and put it in a quilt. And the same with any kind of clothes. Um, even men's clothing they used in their quilts. So, but we're, we didn't come to talk about quilts specifically, but we have a few that belong here, and I brought one of mine that is kind of old. So the sewing machine, the industrial sewing machine, was actually invented in 1790. And it's, um, it was a chain stitch machine. And the first um, domestic machines that came in, I'll get this right, 1850, they were also chain. They made a chain stitch instead of a straight stitch. And then Singer got into the act, and they started 
selling um, uh, electric machines in 1889, which is amazing to me because I've but it's just like now, when something comes in that's new and is useful, people jump on it. And they could buy a machine for about $100, which is actually a lot of money then, but probably 2000 equal to 2000 today. And, um, and so they, they started making things by, by machine. So we've kind of chosen things that are, some are machine and some are handmade. Lady, ladies continued to use dressmakers, and this, the dressmaker would come to your house sometimes and stay and do all your dressmaking for a year or whatever you needed. So, but that, that was mostly done by hand. So we're going to um, talk about a little bit and show these different um, techniques. Um, they did knitting, crocheting, weaving, Embroidery, needle weaving, petty point or needle point, punch needle, beading, quilting, lace making, tanning, and Battenberg lace. And all of these are done by hand, and they are still done by hand. There are needlework groups all over the world that, that preserve that technique and that knowledge of doing things by hand. Um, on the piano in here, we have place some um, household linens. There are napkins, there's a, I think there's a pillowcase, there's all different kinds of, of things that you can look at later. And they could cover most of these techniques. We even have a painted handkerchief. I might have it here. Yeah. So ladies always carried handkerchiefs. You know, they didn't have tissues. And you couldn't. <laughs> that wasn't very ladylike. So they carried little things like this, and it is it is uh, machine made lace, and it has a little flower painted on it in the corner here, and they used um, any kind of paint they could find. They didn't have specific fiber paints at that time, and most of it was um, enamel because it would hold its color. And here I found one that is handmade, hand embroidery, probably from China. Um, it's uh, silk with silk embroidery on it. And this would be a more utilitarian <laughs> kind of hanky. Would, would the embroidery be done in China or by the local woman here? No, this, this one I'm pretty sure was made in China and embroidered in China. We think that they just started trading with us, but they traded with us way back when. <laughs> and sailors would bring back items from other countries to this country when they traveled. So, um, I'll kind of, I don't think, so sewing things. They had magazines like Needlecraft, and this is a copy that belongs in the house. This is from June 1919, and it has ads, of course, and it has patterns. Here's a cro um, crocheted corset cover, <laughs> and you could, you know, if you crochet, you can do that now. You could read these instructions and make a corset cover. Why well, you'd need a corset cover? <laughs> <laughs> but, Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> but there's just, you know, really, if you see some of these magazines, and they're from the early 1900s, you might buy them and donate them to a group that would enjoy them, like here. <laughs> um, one of the, the basic things in crochet were making anti macassar And an anti macassar is like this pineapple crochet over here on the back of the sofa and there's some on that sofa and some on the chairs and the anti macassar came from macassar oil which men put on their hair to make it slick back but the oil would soak into your furniture so they started making anti macassars to keep it protect your your furniture from that um, and you'll see well, throughout the the house there are these these things the, um, 
the housewife would have to have a, a sewing basket. This is a Chinese sewing basket. Doesn't doesn't stamp, so it's pretty early. But you can buy these now at secondhand <laughs> stores, and they have um, jade beads and different kinds of things on top. Coins. They all look pretty much the same, and they all have a tassel. But in it, you would have your scissors and your thread. And I didn't get this stuff out that I was going to show you. So. This is a sewing cabinet. I have one that's similar that my father made in the um, 1930s. And you would have your... Um, Sorry, I'm being a fumble thinker here. Oh, here's a mystery. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know what this is? I don't. You can guess anything and I wouldn't know. It was in the sewing things. Mm -hmm. But it has holes. Maybe thread went through there. Huh. I put a thing on, on Facebook asking if anybody... Yeah, right knew what it was, but I hadn't gotten an answer. Somebody suggested it was for wine bottles. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, to, I had to answer that no. Are, are the holes no. different sizes or all one size? Pardon? Are yeah. the holes different sizes? All one size. Huh. And it could well be a homemade gadget. I have a few of those that I'm still trying to figure out. <laughs> and this cabinet has, um, has a problem with its hinge on this side, but see it has spools of thread, and you unhook it one way or the other, this way I think, to get your, get your thread out, well we'll leave it in there, and the other side has the same, so, and you have knitting, donated some needles. And these are very modern needles. They're aluminum. And um, another thing that everybody had to do was darn socks. Mm -hmm. and, and these went inside the sock mm -hmm. and then you did your right. darning against it. These have not been used very much. <laughs> the ones that have been used, you see the sparks of the yeah. needle on the end. Um, frequently needles were bought in little wooden Cases like this, yes. and um, and they were they're they're very sturdy. They're not going to come open, and they're not going to bend. So they're a good thing. Of course, you have thimbles. This is a nice little silver thimble. And oh, another thing I found in here is a, and there are some upstairs too. Anyone? But, for, your but, for your shoes. Yep. Because you had buttons oh. up shoes. Oh. Yeah. Dell, is it an advertising piece? Because no. many times they were. No, this oh. one isn't. Okay. I think some of the ones upstairs are. Oh. Yeah, we have a little one upstairs that goes with a little child's pair of button yeah. shoes. So it's about that long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they came in different sizes. And here's another thing that I don't think is a mystery, really. But there are two of these in here. This is a thing that's used to turn cord. Right. Oh, and so okay. you cut the strip of fabric yeah. and you feed it through yeah. this yeah. Right. slice here. Mm -hmm. And then you pull it through right. this end. Right. It's yeah. like right. tape, yeah. And yeah. it comes out. Now they have really fancy ones. Mm -hmm. But these were, were here and they may be from that era. And you also bought silk pins, mm -hmm. which were the only kind of pins they wanted to use because of their delicate fabrics. And so they would come in these little boxes. Mm -hmm. I think there were a hundred in here. Can't remember now. Mm. So every every woman had to have a sewing basket, a sewing cabinet, a sewing corner, some place that she could maintain the, the linens and the clothing.
And of course, the main thing was clothing. Everybody needed clothing. You needed everything. Underwear, <coughs> pajamas, ball gowns, whatever. We have um, several children's pieces here. This is a little um, petticoat for a little child. It has very nice um, handmade lace on the bottom here. Then we have a, a ball gown, two parts, it's silk, uh, brocade, it has little bits of lace on it here, looks like handmade. And then the skirt has a waist for an ant. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so that that's the waist. It's about big enough for my arm. <laughs> but it is a beautiful silk brocade. And what happens with silk is it shatters. And the reason that it shatters is because it has me metallic particles on it to to make the brocade, to put the color in, to to make it stiff. That's really the only thing we had. So you can see on the inside here that it's all shredding, and it just, it shreds. It just looks like somebody shredded it with a knife or more. What? You can see some of the shredding on the side. Yeah, it's coming apart. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was a beautiful silk dress, originally. And then we have a little boy's rompers, I think they called them, with the... Um, Battenberg lace here at the collar, a little piece of Battenberg lace. Children dressed like adults mostly. They had fine silk clothes and fine cotton and linen. And, and But this is an example of a little boy's rocker. And here is a, a suit. Might be a little later. Might be 1930s. Or could even be 40s. But... Um, it just looks like an adult piece, except it's short. Mm. And it's very heavy. Poor kid. <laughs> <laughs> and then the thing that has existed for so many people are christening gowns. Because they're passed down from family to family, generation to generation. And uh, we have, there are several here in, in the house. But we just picked out one to show you that and a, a tiny baby it would be a tiny baby when it was christened. So it fits tight up here and then it goes on forever. And then while we're here, we'll say something about the dolls. They made dolls before they did porcelain dolls. <coughs> this one is a, is a handmade cotton body with a porcelain head, two arms, and two legs. But it's all sewn together and stuffed by hand. And uh, it's survived rather well. So it, um, How old do you think it is? Or what does it date to? And it could be as old as 1850. Really? Huh. But um, <coughs> it, they made these up until, I don't know, in the 20s and 30s. And even after that, they made specialized dolls that are worth thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. And then the next thing was porcelain, don't fall down, it was a porcelain doll. It has, uh, she has a hard body, porcelain hands, feet, and probably it looks like real hair mm -hmm. on her. <coughs> And she also is in very good shape. Next to her is a, a bonnet from the 20s. This is tatted. Do you know what tatting? I didn't bring a tatting shuttle. And I didn't find one here. But tatting is a way of making lace. And it's just knotting. You just knot over a thread, uh, carrying thread, until you get 
the size you want and then you pull it together to make a circle. And they're almost all have circles in them, kind of things. And then next to it is probably a uh, mourning hat. Um, everybody wore hats. I still do, I'm old fashioned. And um, this one was in part of the collection here. And it has lace and uh, velvet, uh, different kinds of, of fuzzy things. I don't know if they're feathers or if they're something else, but they look like feathers to me. Okay, and then the other article of clothing is this guy. Now, I think you're all old enough to yeah, remember right. these. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. Anybody that had any money yeah, wore right. a fox mm -hmm. scarf, yep. a fox shawl, and they're complete. They have hands, oh. eyes, <laughs> <laughs> teeth, teeth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and a little crochet <laughs> hook thing here to hook it on. And you just wore it around your, your neck, hanging down. I know. <laughs> I couldn't stand them when I was a child. I just like, you know, I thought terrible. But they're very rare now because of the, they went out of a fashion, but also because of the, the movement to not kill animals for fashion. And uh, I, I don't know if you can still find fur anything, real fur anything, but now they have uh, artificial fur <laughs> that looks very much like the old stuff. But you can pet him if you come up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Poor guy. I can add just a little bit of historic uh, value to that one. Is any of you who are familiar with Tynes, Jim, and Clary Tynes was uh, the wife of John Tynes, and she's the daughter of the lady who owned that, Mrs. Beggarly. Oh. So that's a local connection to that uh, fox story. And they wore them, wore furs throughout the 1800s and the 1900s. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother had a mink coat, it's kind of ratty, but it's... Mm -hmm. I think we have coat. a picture of Hartwell's wedding, and mm -hmm. one of the attendants is wearing a, a fox. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was down into the 20s as well. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, at, at the end of the 1800s, uh, the S shape for women went out of style. You know, you used to see women that had this pouty bosom and um, kind of a big butt and a, maybe even a bustle. Mm -hmm. And it, about, about, the, about 1900, that kind of went out of style. And it got slimmer and slimmer till World War I. And then, just like World War II, it was hard to get material. It was hard to, to make things. And they slimmed it down and slimmed it down until it was more like this, which is a actually a, probably a party dress. And this is a beautiful example. It has a, even has a, a slip with it. Because you couldn't wear this without a slip. You could see right through it. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> and on this you see beading work done. Beading was very, very big in the 20s. And I'm sure that the lady that owned this house wore this kind of a dress. Um, but you see it goes straight down, no puffies, and no puffy sleeves, and they also wore like the padded um, hat up there, the little skull thing that they wore um, on their head, and they cut their hair. Instead of having big Mufon hairdos, they started wearing shorter, shorter hair. Um, I only have one thing for guys. And that's these wonderful cuffs and collars, which are undoubtedly miserable to wear. <laughs> but the collars um, had a button or a cuff link, like a cuff link, only it's a collar link that hold them together here. And then this, these are the these are the cuffs, and this is the collar, and it has a button here, so you button it to the button in the back of your suit, and. Um, bring it up and put the collar button here. And then you walk around like this. <laughs> but they had to be stiff like that. And those went out about the time of the uh, First World War. Um, wars change things. They're, they make things not available. And they make people see 
other things, other places, and they carry that home with them. Um, this is a, a lace collar. Probably, this is probably from the 40s. Has a little um, tassel in the back to hold it. And this is a jabot, which you might wear with a lace collar or just on a dress. And this is um, tatted and uh, has a little embroidered circle. This is probably a homemade thing. And something that some lady made to wear. And it goes right like that. I had a teacher that wore this. And then, of course, we have gloves. Everybody had to wear gloves. Everybody wore gloves. Um, I had friends that give me a bad time because when I came to California in 1957, um, I went to the grocery store with gloves and heels and hat and the whole thing because where I grew up in outside of Portland, that was the style. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took me a while to stop wearing the gloves, but I'm sticking with the hat. <laughs> <laughs> and another little treasure we have here, and we have several pieces of this, are hairpins. And this is, um, we've got, oh, what is it? Oh, I was telling you the name of the family. It's, in, it's from the McFadden family again. You know, I cannot, none of the word has gotten away from me, but um, this, this material is like plastic, but it's pre-plastic. Oh, Bakeware? Oh, yeah. Bakelite? Bakelite? Bakelite, yeah. Bakelite. Bakelite, yeah. There you go. <laughs> and it has little diamonds inserted. Of course, they're not real diamonds. But mm -hmm. They, um, w this went with the big hair. Yeah. So when the big hair went out, they didn't need these anymore. So this one is almost intact. It has one little leg off right there. And... Where are we with time? A half hour, that's good. Um, oh, sorry. Huh? You said you could go real quick? Um, You had good towels for company. When company came, you used your old towels until they walked in the door, and then you got out your special <laughs> <laughs> hand <and burden> <laughs> towels. And uh, when I was a child, this was what we did with our downtime. We embroidered everything. Mm -hmm. You know, paint pillowcases, sheet tops, towels. I don't even remember what other thing. This is probably a mourning handkerchief because when you went, to, when somebody died, you went into mourning for a certain length of time, depending on what was in your culture. Um, sometimes it was years, sometimes it was six months, depending on what your culture had to say. And you would have everything would be black or gray or violet or lavender, and um, and so you had to have handkerchiefs that were mourning handkerchiefs too. Here's one from the U.S. Army Air Force. Oh. This was probably um, pre-World War I. And it's, it's hand embroidered. Somebody probably did it in memory of their person that was in the military or died. I don't know. Is it a gold star? I'm sorry? What color is the star? Is it? What color is this? It's the star. The star. <laughs> I knew you were oh, going to I knew. That's, now you're nodding me. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's USAAF, yeah. US Army Air Force. So it was before the Air Force was organized. Yeah, so that happened after the Second World War. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And then we have Petty Point and Needle Point. Petty Point. Tiny, tiny, tiny little stitches. Actually, 
I'll take it back. I think this is probably punch needle. And a punch needle has a little spring on it. And you thread it and you punch like that. And it makes loops on the top. And then it just goes over however much you move it. It goes over on the back. And then this is, is typical of, of um, sometimes when mine disappears, of needlepoint. Very fine needlepoint, but this is what they did. Has a backing. And this is from Boop Bouvel, made in Belgium. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of this when I was a child that people brought back from World War II. Something that I'm sure we all remember from our childhood is crocheted potholders. <laughs> Some were somewhat plain, like this, and a little fancier with multiple colors of thread. These are all handmade, and then we have some more. These are a little thicker. They have a layer on the back and fancy flowers on the front. Everybody had these. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was just mm -hmm. what you used. I had big, thick ones myself. But mm -hmm. <laughs> so, And so we'll get down to the quilts. Um, they don't have very many, and most of the quilts that are in the house are from the 30s and 40s. Um, this one is actually a new quilt made by a member of the... Yippee. Did you make it? <laughs> <laughs> Judy D. Yep. But you didn't make it. You just donated it. No, I made it. Oh, it says Maker Unknown. It does? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you're not quite famous. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is um, Irish chain, a pattern that's made over and over and over again over the years. And um, this is about the size of my first quilt. Little squares, two inch squares. And uh, it's very, um, very fun for little girls to learn to make their, mm -hmm. their own things. This one, on the other hand, is probably from the, um, maybe the 20s or earlier. Mm -hmm. You see this pink fabric that you have here. It has a medium pink in the background, and it has little dark pink um, patterns on it. That's called a double pink, and that was a very, very popular fabric. They made it, even made it in um, feed sacks. Oh, because oh. in the 30s, um, during the Depression, the feed sack people decided that, that they needed to make fabric that could be reused. And so they made their flower sacks and their feed sacks out of um, printed fabric. So this one, this one is older, has one on the back too. Kind of, kind of, hardly, you know, worn hardly, badly, badly would be a better word. And this pattern is just diamonds. It doesn't have a, a name as far as I could find. <laughs> then we have the one on the end which is a grandmother's flower garden. Very popular pattern, starting in the 20s, and, and is still made today. The technique that most people use is called English paper piecing. And they cut hexagons from paper or cardboard, or now plastic, and they put the fabric around that template and stitch it so that it's closed. And then when they have a bunch of them, I have to sit down, I'm sorry. Do you think that one was hand sewed or machine? No, no it's not. Oh. Sorry about that. That's okay. Am I pale? 
Anyway, this is the oldest quilt that belongs here in the house. Mm -hmm. And it's probably 1880, 1890. Wow. Then Grandmother's Flower comes in all different sizes. Some hexagons are this big. Some of them are this big. <laughs> Depends on how adventurous you are with your sewing. Can you sew that together? I don't know, I could. Then the next one is what's called a strippy quilt, or stripy quilt, some people call it. But the strippy quilt also has a double pink in it. And it's just cutting long strips of fabric and sewing them together and then quilting it, putting a back and a batting and then the top, which in England they call flimsies. Oh. <laughs> An unfinished top is a flimsy. Mm. <laughs> and, um, and it has a double pink in it, a common um, early 19th century, a 1900s um, beige piece. This one on the end uh, is reminiscent of the chintz quilts. And it is, if you look at it, you'll see that it's quilted in hoops like this. Mm -hmm. And they call that um, I'm, with me. I'm here with you. <laughs> <laughs> Met Methodist fan or Episcopal fan or Amish fan or whatever whatever religion right. you Should belong to. Right. They, come <laughs> they, they claim it. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and people use that same pattern. You put your elbow on the corner of the quilt or on the side of the quilt. You have a pencil with a, with a string on it. Oh, and you mark oh. an arc. Then you roll the pencil two times or three times, whatever distance you want. Oh, and then you make another one, <laughs> another one. And so then when you get to the edge of the quilt, then you start either next to it or you go up to the top and you do another one. Mm -hmm. And that's a very common um, quilting pattern that's done everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, like I say, everybody claims it. Uh, people do it with machine quilting too. It's not just mm -hmm. hand quilting. The other quilt that we have is this one that's in the other room. That's a flying geese quilt. Oh. And it's from about 1880. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the fabrics, you'll see that some of them have have worn away. And part of that is the dye um, that just just like the silk that shatters because of the minerals. Well, the dye had caustic chemicals in it. So as time went by, it was exposed to the light and it will eat away the fabric. It came to me from a lady who got it from her neighbor who belong to her aunt. <laughs> you don't get that kind of information with old quilts or mm -hmm. old anything. So if you have an old quilt, even a vintage quilt, something from 1940 or 1950 or any time, you want to write something down about it. If you can, write it with a permanent pin on fabric and, and sew it to the back of the quilt, or write it on paper and pin it to the back of the quilt, or sew it to the back of the quilt. But you need to, to save that information because it, in, it increases the value of your quilt because it has a provenance. But it also um, is, is, is sharing your history. And even if it doesn't stay in your family, it goes to someone else, and probably a collector, and and they have that history then. And so you you always want to keep track of that kind of thing, not just in quilts though, but but any antique things you have or things that you think are valuable, you write write it down. You know, you can do it in the computer even. <laughs> so it's um, it's it's part of it's part of the way that we can preserve our history. Like in this house. Yeah. It's, it's a 1900 house. 1901 or 1900. <coughs> so, um, but people, Joanne says that she grew up in a house like this. And I knew, I knew family that had houses very much like this. Um, I grew up in Portland mostly. And, um, and it's really something we need to pass down to our younger people, um, 
I did tours at Heritage House for a while at uh, Cal State Fullerton, and I enjoyed it so much. And some of the kids were really interested, and um, others are just <laughs> completely. And that's been 20 years ago, so I'm mm -hmm. sure the kids today are not too keen on that because they want to be at their computers mm -hmm. or on their phone. So, can I answer anything else for anybody? What? Was that? I'm sorry, go ahead. What about the draperies? Would they be made by the lady of the house, or? If they would, uh, probably. And are these ones original? Yeah. No. Uh, sometimes they have, um, they would have um, a hired help that was specialized in, in draperies or wedding dresses or children's clothes or whatever, and they would come to the house. And, and many of these older, larger houses had sewing rooms that were devoted to that. And uh, some of them had a cot for the seems just to sleep on at night. <laughs> so, so we have that now? <laughs> right. We have quite a collection of wedding dresses, too, ranging from, uh, I don't know, really early ones, maybe Nancy knows, but up into like the 30s. Oh, wow. And the thing is universal that I noticed, because I donated my mother's wedding dress from 1935, Women were really tiny, <laughs> <laughs> really tiny. Yeah. So, so did you? This quilt was it hand sewn or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's oh. hand pieced. All those little triangles were <laughs> put together by hand, and then it's quilted by hand. <laughs> and uh, it it really is a treasure. And I came by it because the lady was in hospice and she didn't know anybody that would take care of it, and her family didn't oh. want it. And, well, she asked yeah. me if I if I would find a home for it, and mm. although I don't collect them anymore, um, I took it, and, and if I don't keep it for a while, I'll find a home for it. Right. Of course, at my age, I'm going to have to find a home for everything. It's up to me. Right. 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 I should start now. Right. Right. Okay, anything else? Anybody I, wants to I have a question yeah. about this grandmother's garden here, uh -huh. and you said there was a, a template that was used, and then they sewed around it. Yeah. I, you mean... They sewed two pieces together. Oh no, no they no, did it no. by hand. So they would okay. So it's like that little uh, hexagon, hexagon is the template. Like you cut it's it out the, of paper, like one part of it, and then you stitch all around it so it's attached to that paper. And then you put two pieces together and you whip them together. And so each one of those, you, and then you open it up and then you add your third one and your fourth one and you go around and around. So it's all hand sewn together. So and then you turn out, take out the little paper parts. Oh, okay. yeah, they're, they're, using, they they're using they're yeah. using a paper or cardboard as the template so that all the hexes are the same size. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, so when oh. you cut the fabric out, it's all the same size hexagon. What Otherwise, if you're trying to hand cut oh, it, so you just, it'll all be hidden. It's not paper. there when you're sewing. Yes, yeah, yeah. the paper yeah. could be in there when you're sewing, right? Yes. And you and you take the paper out after you stitch the the hexagons together. So you're not sewing through the so, paper? So you have this hexagon no, and this hexagon. It still has paper. Yeah. And you put them together and you sew them the, together. The seam allowance is turned under first. Like this is like your, this is like your, where you work. Where's the paper when your hand goes like that? Okay, so say these are the papers, right? <laughs> the this paper is the paper inside side. your hand. That's the paper, okay. Right? Fabric and is wrapped around. Well, and the fabric's wrapped around. So they'll take the two fabrics and stitch them together like that. Okay. Here. Fabric here. Here. Fabric here. Stitch Without them touching the paper. And then it'll be open. And when they have it all done, then they take this paper out. Right. And so it's just fabric. Yeah, when the whole quilt is sewn together. Oh, I was thinking you were there sewing the paper and you had all these little holes I that you I will bring some to our board meeting Tuesday night because I have a little sack that is what I call my travel project. Uh -huh. oh. It fits in the suitcase. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, okay. hey, eventually, well, I did make one large quilt, but eventually, if I live long enough, I'll have another one. <laughs> So I'll bring it with me right. Tuesday okay. night and show you. Do you know when yo-yo quilts were, what, what, when, when was the time that yo-yo quilts started? Okay. In England, uh, they made them early, early in the, in the uh, 1900s, maybe in the late 18s. But they called them Sussex Puffs. Oh. 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 But they're the same as yo-yos. And a yo-yo, I've shown you a yo-yo. Is that thing you make with the doll? That you you have a circle and, and you, you sew, sew around it and then you draw up that and you make a little round puff. Uh -huh. And that's what they call Sussex puffs. 
and um, okay. so it, it started in the in the late very late 1800s and then it became more and more popular by the 1930s it was very very popular and, yeah. and nobody knows what to do with them now yeah, I have a jar full of Sussex pups. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Well, I think my grandmother made dolls out of them. Yes. You, oh, you, you yeah. sew through yes. the center yeah. and that makes little legs. And yes, they yes. had little clowns with them. Yes, yes. yes. little Doggy clowns. Dolls. And you can make a vest yeah. with it. Yeah. It's a really cute vest. Vest? I've got a yeah. vest with, made out of yo yo. Oh, you have yes. a what? A, a vest. vest. A vest. Oh, there's a picture of my vest, Trudy. <laughs> I'm holding, but that's okay. See, oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. one of them. Oh, very nice. I'm very I'm never changed well with Gina. Yeah. <laughs> is it a no, Christmas it's bed? different. It's Christmas. Yeah. The back is one solid piece of fabric. Oh. Quilted. You and the same that. kind of similar thing. Once you make those, once oh, you make the little circle oh. parts, then you put the two little circle parts together and you glue them together oh. and glue them together. Yeah. So there's so open work in it. There's nothing behind that. What did you call the uh, quilt top? Uh, oh, yeah. flimsy. They, they call them flimsy. Flimsy. Yeah. Flimsy. Okay. Flimsy. Instead of UFOs, we should call them flimsy. They have to be put together, though. They can't be a UFO. So it's oh, right. well, well, no, no, no. no. Right. We, we can There's have a no showing of flimsies one right. day. Yeah, oh, that's a good idea. idea. <laughs> that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Put unquilted quilts. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we, we don't call them just quilt them. tops. They're now flimsies. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, what about like the history of crazy quilting? Oh. Crazy quilts um, came along in the um, 1800s, in the in about the middle, um, and part of it was um, waste not wasn't want not, but they didn't make them to sleep in, sleep with. Usually, they made them for piano covers and mm -hmm. so forth drape on your sofa and everything. And it was a chance to show off your embroidery mm -hmm. because everybody embroidered. And so they would cover the seams with uh, hand embroidery. Um, sometimes after the machines came along, they would piece the pieces together, but then they still do the hand embroidery. They also did painting and um, ruching and just all kinds of different fancy things. And it was to show your ability that how talented you were to mm -hmm. to make this beautiful piece. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dale, what? what about applique quilts? What about them? <laughs> Is there a time frame for them when they They've made always them? made applique quilts from oh, when okay. they first start excuse me, mm -hmm. started um, using quilting for clothing, for example, in the seventeen hundreds. <laughs> they would have um, petticoats that were uh, applique with flowers and then quilted. They were very heavy because, of course, they didn't have central heating. And so ladies would wear these really heavy um, uh, under uh, petticoats. I lost the word there. And, uh, and they, they decorated them in all kinds of ways. They put beads on them. Flower, applique flowers and leaves and vines and little birdies and so, but they uh, applique has been around. I don't know. I I imagine for thousands of years because mm -hmm. they have um, animal pelts that have pieces applique onto them oh. um, with with other animal pelts. You know, mm -hmm. you, you skin a bear and you use that to to make a covering and then you put other animal skins and cut them out in shapes and stuff. So they're they're very old. They they may go back as far as I know to the to, to one thousand. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. That's that's been a, a very um, rich textile research thing and how, how far back they go. So anything anybody else know any want any, know anything I know? <laughs> how about Trapanto? Trapunto. Trapunto. Is that a quilting top? Are you yeah. familiar with trapunto? Mm -hmm. Trapunto is when you, you make a channel. So you sew like a stem and you sew down each side and then you run a cord through it or two cords or you might make a shape and then stuff batting underneath the, mm -hmm. the shape that you've applied. And so when you feel the quilt, it has all these, every shape is... An extra dimension to it. 
Bargain yes, an extra, extra dimension. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So you can put more dimension into the surface of it with extra padding and cording. Yeah. And cording and trapunto are kind of, you know, joined together. And and that was another thing they did a lot on petticoats in the um, 16, 1700. Oh. Because it was cold, you know. Mm -hmm. they, they wore clothes to keep warm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then when we got into the the 1800s, especially the second half, then there was more um, more heat, more uh, central, like fireplaces in every room and that kind of thing, and so they could wear less clothes, less heavy clothes. Another thing that, that might be interesting is that in during World War I, um, especially the British that wore heavy uh, wool uniforms, mm -hmm. and they cut the uniforms up and made fantastic geometric quilts, oh, wow. and they're all <coughs> red, blue, black, oh. cream. I think that was the only four colors that they used, but they cut out the pieces and they did kind of like um, hexagons. You know, they, they cut the pieces and stitch here and then open them up, stitch another one on, open it up, kind of the old-fashioned way. But you can see those in museums some places, mm -hmm. and they're, they're quite beautiful. They have small pieces, some of them just tiny little pieces, but the soldiers were doing it and doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. And part of that also was keeping warm. Mm -hmm. So they have a worn out uniform they yeah. <laughs> Right. Right. Share, share and share alike sort of that. I don't think I know anything well, else. Well, thank you for sharing all that you shared with us. Yeah. Yeah. Society. There you go, the author. Thank yeah. you very much for sharing with us. We appreciate yeah. it. I, I would like to there. make a shameless plug. Okay. If anybody here has any vintage quilts and they don't know if their family wants them, I'm sure we would be happy to accept them. <laughs> and give you a donation receipt for whatever value you wish to put on them. Especially if you have provenance on them. Especially if you know if where you they know, came from. But even not, yeah. I mean, because we recently realized we don't we saw you don't have a lot of quilts. Also, I'm the membership chairman. That says enough. So if you're interested <laughs> in joining the Founder Society, you can see me afterward. And the, the brochure is on the counter here and it yes. has the information in it also if you're interested. And if you're a senior citizen, it costs all of twenty dollars a year. Oh. <laughs> all right. We're just money. <laughs> well, and the other thing to make note of is that we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Placentia Founder Society here on April 13th in conjunction with Placentia Chamber of Commerce, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce was founded by A.S. Bradford, whose house this is, and he was the mayor of the city, founded the first bank, one of the principal gentlemen of the city of Placentia. So uh, you guys are all welcome to come to that. Um, I'll be, if you're members of ours, then you'll be getting the email with uh, information about buying tickets and coming to the event. So it's going to be a lot of fun, <laughs> great way to celebrate mm -hmm. the Founder Society and as well as the Chamber of Commerce here on April the 13th. So that's my shameless plug. Right. <laughs> the house is 120 some years old and we've had it for 50 of those years. That wow. just amazes me because they gave it up. You know, the family did, and the city was going to think of tearing it down because there were a couple fires. So it amazes me when I think that we are getting close to having it as long as, yeah. as, Bradford, as yeah. the house. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. You have given me a, a Starbucks card. Okay. I go to Starbucks with my doggy twice a week. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday and Sunday. Does your doggy get the doggy cream? He does sometimes. Yeah. Depends on how much he she weighs. Yeah. <laughs> I, on the other hand. <laughs> so thank you so, so much for coming. Yeah, and well, if I can, you know, thank help you, you in any way, let me know. And all the things that she had held up are out here on the piano. If you want yeah. to look again, now that you know what they are, you can <laughs> appreciate them a little bit more. Yeah, and you can see the pictures of the people and the kind of clothing yeah. that they wore. And. Uh, after after the um, about maybe 1910, he lost the mono, the mono bosom and the bustle and all that. And since then, people clothes have just gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> <laughs>
shocking. <laughs> yes. It really is. It really is. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We did. We did. We did. Oh, no, I think it was great. Yeah, definitely. They're still broadcasting, so no profanity, Nancy. Thank you for the warning. Well, it was in a box in yeah. the children's room, and most of the clothing we have yeah. are in the boxes so in Bradford's right, bedroom. Right, right. So this one, when they did the inventory of the children's room, they had found it, but they didn't know that maybe it should go 